You're listening to the Podcast of the Branch in Ashland, Virginia. Life has a way of making us wonder if we're all alone, if Jesus is really with us, and if he even cares. Even though the disciples had consented to follow Jesus, they didn't always know just what following Jesus would entail. I imagine we might feel the same way at times. In this episode, we look at Jesus and his disciples in the boat during a storm. The disciples think they're going to drown, but they find out more of who Jesus is by how he responds to that storm in the boat. Um, appreciate prayers. I know uh, all you all who are from the branch knew that um, Sam and Taryn and I were in Colorado this week. Uh, maybe the miraculous thing was that I only had one flight delay, um, both there and back, um, and made it fairly uh, seamlessly on the way back. But we uh, were together with other church planners from our network of churches, from our denomination, the EPC, uh, just taking part, encouraging one another, having conversations about what God is doing in the different places where we are. And, um, you know, travel isn't like it used to be. For those of you who, who travel frequently, you can, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but once upon a time I used to love traveling, and nowadays it's not as exciting as it was when I was in my 20s. And I, I just get into this real focused zone, like I just want to get from here to there and don't get in my way. And if you do, then um, it's probably not going to be pretty. And so I, I was just feeling a little anxious on Thursday as I was waiting for my Uber in front of the place where we were staying. And, and the driver stopped, he got out, he put my bags in and I stepped into the car expecting that I was just going to have my typical, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to get to the airport and go. And I looked on the center console of his car and there was a Bible sitting there. And, and so I just kind of looked to the sky and smirked and said, okay, God, I get it. Like, you, you want me to do something more. And so as we talked, his name was Christian, his, he and I talked and he shared he had moved from Brooklyn a few years ago. Brooklyn is where I was born, and um, he had lost his dad uh, in the last year, and I lost my dad about 10 years ago. And so as we talked, he um, specifically mentioned that he was feeling like he was in a storm in his life. Um, and, and over and over again, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, don't you dare get out of this car without praying with him, for him. And so uh, we got to the front of the airport and the terminal, and I just said, hey, is, would you mind if I pray for you? And of course, by the end of the, every time I think I'm done with tears over this last month, I, I start crying again. And sure enough, as, as we were praying, uh, the tears just started streaming. And, and he just talked about how blessed he was. And I just told him, I said, Christian, I'm going to keep praying for you in this storm. And I'm going to keep praying that God will, will just meet you there uh, in this place where you are. And, and we got out, and he helped me with my bags. And after 15 minutes of knowing him, we embraced as if we'd known each other all our lives. And I was just so in, incredibly marveled at the fact that there in the Colorado Springs airport, uh, with a guy who I'd only met 15 minutes before, God had used that moment. And that he, I didn't say anything to him immediately about being a pastor. It wasn't until further in our conversation about that. And I certainly didn't tell him that my sermon this coming Sunday was going to be about a storm. But that was the word that he used, which really stood out to me. Um, because I, I thought to myself, here I was in a car with somebody who was experiencing a storm in life, and, and chances are we've probably all been in that place where we're either in a storm, uh, we may have just gotten through a storm, or we're getting ready to go into a storm. And we don't always know what that's going to look like. We can often convince ourselves in the midst of those places that we're alone. And over and over again, I, I, that's the word that I was getting about this, this guy, was that he was disconnected from, from people. And so, I, you know, I hope and pray that, that God used me in some way to, to connect him back because in the midst of the storm, I feel like the enemy always tries to convince us that we're by ourselves. He tries to 
get us isolated so that we feel like we're all alone and we're abandoned. And this morning we're going to take a look into an account in Matthew chapter 18 about, or Matthew chapter 8, sorry, about, um, about Jesus and His disciples going into a storm. You know, when Jesus called His disciples out of the lives that each of them had, I, I don't expect that they fully knew exactly what their life was going to be when they called Him, or they were called by Him. I, I, I wonder if they, uh, there were multiple times along the way that they somewhat felt ill-equipped to, to be able to be on this journey. And even after Jesus ascended into heaven, I wonder what they were thinking and as they're like, well, we're, we're all alone. How, how are we going to do this? In Matthew chapter 8, we encounter this story, this account of Jesus and the disciples getting into a boat and going on a journey across the lake. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. And just, I would encourage you this week, if you are searching for something uh, as far as studying uh, to do in your daily reading through the Bible, go back and read the, the early part of, of Matthew chapter 8. Because we see, again, last week we talked about the progression with Nicodemus, and we see this progression of Jesus' day that Matthew orders these accounts leading up to this journey with his disciples that, that first uh, he, Jesus heals a leper in the beginning of Matthew 8. And then Jesus heals the servant of a centurion. And then Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then demon-possessed people are brought to Jesus and He heals them. And, and there were multiple people who are brought to Jesus and He heals them. And then a, a teacher of the law comes to Jesus. And if, again, if you watched online or listened online last week, we were talking about Nicodemus. So uh, a teacher of the law very similar to Nicodemus approaches Jesus and he says in Matthew 8 verse 19, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And I really think that Matthew probably intentionally put that account right before the account that we're looking into today because of really what that means. Because I think for those of us who follow after Jesus, we say, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And then we start to understand exactly what that means. And we realize that maybe it doesn't mean what we think it means. Maybe it means something way harder than what we thought it means. We may say we're willing to follow Jesus and then we spend the rest of our lives really trying to understand what that means. And so in Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 23, this is what we read. And he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake. So the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. You know, the disciples had been with Jesus long enough to know that when he says go, you had to go. And so they get into this boat, and I imagine that when they got into the boat, there, there wasn't a storm necessarily there, but they just got in. And Jesus was tired. We just talked about how he had been healing people all day. And, and so he was probably not only physically, but emotionally exhausted as well. And the disciples, they followed Jesus into that boat, and I don't think they knew what was going to happen. I mean, they knew to expect the unexpected because that was what following Jesus really meant. But there they go and they get into this boat. But all the disciples really knew was the history of God's people and the history of the promises that God had made to His people. They were probably familiar with the promise that God had made to His people in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Where God said, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 
following Jesus involves our heads and our hearts. That part of us needs to have answers in order to know where to step, but we also need to trust in the promises of God. We need to put our hearts there as well. And faith doesn't always give us the concise answers that we'd really like. We'd like to be able to see what's ahead. For me, man, I'd love to have like this five-year plan and say, okay, I can see all the way down the road. I know what's coming. But that's not faith. That's not what God calls us to. That's not what we're called to even as we follow after Jesus. Following after Jesus means that we're stepping out, we're getting into the boat, even though we don't know what kind of storms are going to arise around us. And it propels us forward and we cling to the promises that God has made to His people knowing that He's never broken His promise. He's never gone back on that. And sometimes we have to look backwards in order to go forwards. We need to say, hey, okay God, how have I seen You work? How have I heard Your promises in the past? And how is that going to propel me to what's next? The disciples get on the boat. Jesus is sleeping there. And, and uh, you know, I'm envious of that kind of sleep that Jesus has. I mean, and we all probably know somebody who does that, right? Like the moment their, their head hits the pillow, they're out cold. And, uh, you know, a freight train could drive right past them and it wouldn't wake them up at all. They wouldn't stir at all. And I imagine that Jesus, with all that exhaustion in him, he's laying down on the side of that boat. The waves are coming over and he's still sleeping. And I'm thinking, how do you do that? And the disciples were probably thinking the same thing. Like, how do you do that, Jesus? You're still sleeping. And the disciples are freaking out. They go into fight or flight mode. And when we go into fight or flight mode, it's all about survival. Like, how are we going to get by? How are we going to make it through this? And I'm sure that the disciples came to that place where they're going, oh my goodness, there's waves coming over. They probably didn't say, oh my goodness. But they waves coming over the boat. And they're thinking that how, we can't get this water out fast enough. Doesn't Jesus even care? Maybe they forgot He was there because He was sleeping on the side. And they wonder, how can we get through this? We're going to drown. That's what they say to Him. And that's what the disciples call out. They say, Lord, save us. They cry out and they say, we're going to drown And I wonder how often in life do we look at the waves, we hear and feel the wind, and then we project what's going to happen to us. And I'm the king of this. I can see the pieces. You know, part of the engineer in me is to, to think about the worst case scenario all the time and then project and design out. And so I prepare myself as I start seeing the pieces roll up. And I go, okay, well, here's how it's going to happen even before I know. And I wonder if the disciples were doing that because they said, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. We're not going to be able to take this. I think one of the things that can easily happen to us when we get into these moments, when we're in the boat, Jesus is there, and we can hear the wind, we can see the waves, And we can automatically convince ourselves that the presence of difficulties and storms and challenges in our lives means that either God has abandoned us or that we've done something wrong. And let me tell you right now that this is absolutely important. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. The presence of difficulties and storms and challenges in our lives does not mean that God has abandoned you. And it does not mean that you've done something wrong. Again, this is, our nat- this is my natural tendency. It's like, oh man, this is happening, so therefore God must be pretty mad at me. Or God must have turned His back on me. The presence of storms, trials, and difficulties does not automatically mean that Jesus is not with us. He is with us in the storm. We may feel like he's sleeping. We may wonder if he even cares. We may wonder if he's ever going to wake up to keep us from drowning, but he's there. 
And Jesus wakes up. The disciples wake Him up. And He says to them, You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And and you know, I'll tell you what. This is one of those passages that I've read countless times. And it's been very interesting to watch how I've heard Jesus' words as I've understood God more. As I've gotten to know Jesus more. Because once upon a time, when I heard those words from Jesus, I took them as scolding words and demeaning words. Oh, you of little faith. What's wrong with you disciples? How could you miss this? How, how do you not know that I'm here? And I had to like repent of that. <laughs> that that's not the way. I don't think Jesus was saying it like that. I don't think Jesus was saying, come on guys, what's wrong with you knuckleheads? I think Jesus was saying it compassionately. I don't think He was disappointed with them. I don't think He was talking down to them. I think Jesus was saying with care and compassion, Oh, you of little faith. I'm not going to let you drown. I'm here. And I hear that longing in Jesus' voice for His disciples to get it, to better understand, for us to get it, to know that we're not alone. We're not abandoned. We're not walking through this all by ourselves. That Jesus just wanted them to know, I've saved you before and I will save you again. You know, five times within Matthew's Gospel, we hear that phrase, little faith. And four of those, he, he specifically says, you of little faith. Matthew 8.30, Matthew, 8, or Matthew 6.30, Matthew 8.26, Matthew 14.31, Matthew 6.8, and then, or 16.8, and then Matthew 17.20. And I wonder about you, how you hear those words from Jesus. When Jesus says those words to you, you of little faith, are you hearing it as a scolding? Are you taking it as like you've done something wrong? Are you hearing it compassionately? Are you hearing Him say to you, hey, I'm here. Hey, I understand your faith is struggling right now, but I got you. I got you in this. Matthew chapter 6, during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about worry. And how if he, if he clothes the flowers and the trees and He feeds the birds, how much more important are we than them? And don't we expect that He would do the same for us? And Jesus has said elsewhere in Matthew, in Matthew 17.20, that it only takes faith the size of a mustard seed to move a mountain. Again, go back and read that first part of Matthew 8 this week. We're not going to take time this morning to do it, but there's a a centurion who has so much faith in God, so much faith in Jesus' ability to be able to heal that he says, Jesus, don't even waste your time coming to my house because I know you can heal my servant from here. And Jesus is blown away and he's like, man, I can't even find this kind of faith in Israel. You're a Gentile and you've got this faith. That's blowing me away. And Jesus says, All we need is faith the size of a mustard seed. You see, it isn't the size of our faith that matters. It's what we put it in. And again, remember that. Imprint it upon your heart. Put it on your mirror. Put it on the dashboard of your car. Remember, it's not the size of your faith that matters. It's what you put it in. You're putting our faith and trust in Jesus. It can be the size of a tiny little mustard seed. That's it. Tiny faith in God-sized ability. That's what matters. Not what our faith looks like, but who we put it in. The disciples respond to what Jesus does. And Jesus comes out. He wakes up. He wipes the sleep from his eyes. And he he calms the storm. And there the disciples are. A minute ago they thought they were going to drown. And and here they are just looking at the, the calm sea. And I think what they say really tells us that they didn't fully understand what they were doing when they said, Jesus, we'll follow you wherever we go. Wherever you go. Because they say, what kind of man is this? Like, who did we follow here? 
Like we got into a boat, the storms came and they started rushing over the side and we're like, we're going to drown, save us, Lord. And then all of a sudden it stops and they're like, who is this guy? Do we fully get who he is? Have you ever had God blow, blow your mind like that before? Where, where you're like, I know exactly what's going to happen. Some of us are really good at projecting things out. I know exactly how this is going to turn out. And then God blows our mind by making it not like that. And I don't think the disciples' statement here is anything other than a note to us that they are human. That they're still trying to figure out who Jesus is and what it means to follow Him. They're trying to understand him a little bit more, and hopefully in that we can feel like, hey, we're pretty similar to that. I get it. We're, we're right there with them. You see, sometimes we follow Jesus into a storm not knowing exactly where we're headed, but trusting that we're with the right person. And then the storms rise up, they surround us, they threaten us, they overtake us. And we wonder if he's really there. Does he really care? Have I done something wrong? Do I deserve this? But we shouldn't be ashamed that our faith may seem to fail us in these times. But I think we need to ask ourselves the same question that the disciples ask. Say, who is this guy? (laughs) Who is this guy that we're following? And when we ask that question, then we hear the answer back that this is the one who came to save you. That we begin to understand a little bit more what the gospel is. That that Jesus meets us in the fray. He meets us in the storm. He doesn't leave us there. He says, I'm with you. And He doesn't do it because we've earned it. He doesn't do it because uh, we've somehow or another measured up. He does it because He loves us. He cares for us deeply in and out of the storm. Whether we're in the storm or out of the storm, Jesus loves us just the same. And He meets us there just the same. And He's with us there just the same. And so this morning, what's our storm? Maybe you're in this place where you're like, hey, you know what? I, I, things have been pretty good for me. I have no storm. Others of us might feel like, man, <laughs> I've been crying out over and over again. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And I'm wondering. He's like not waking up. We feel like we're going to drown. You know, just when I thought that you know, all the storms in life had kind of subsided for a little while, I got news uh, yesterday morning about another tragedy within our community. A young um, 48-year-old uh, who's connected to uh, Restoration, our sister church, um, lost his life in a car accident. And, and as I sat there that You know, thinking about that, thinking about my friend Johnny who passed away. This past week, I got news that uh, a friend of mine who has a middle child named Tucker as well, uh, who I know from high school, that her her son was diagnosed with cancer at at 13 years old. And I was like, Lord, help. Save us. The storms, the, the, the waves are washing over the side of the boat, and I just don't think we can take it anymore. And as I sat down there looking out at God's beautiful creation in Colorado this week, I I sat down and wrote and thought about what it would be like to be in the boat with the disciples. And so as I I read this, I invite you to listen. If If it helps you to close your eyes as you listen, then so be it. But as I read this, picture yourself in that boat. Picture yourself as the first person in this story. As the storm rages around me, the waves are crashing over the side of the boat. I'm not sure how much more this I or this boat can take. How can Jesus not stop this? Why isn't He waking up? Doesn't He care that this storm is raging? Doesn't He care that I'm going to drown? Unable to contain my anxiety any longer, I descend into the depths of the boat where Jesus is sleeping. 
You never know what's going on outside based upon the peace and calm that seems to be surrounding him. How can he sleep so soundly with this storm raging outside? I lean down and try to wake him up, doing my best to not let all of my anxiety and fear translate into that shake, but probably shaking him a little harder than I should have. He stirs. Jesus, I said. Jesus, you need to wake up. He stirs but remains unfazed. I shake him a little harder and I can hear my own fear in my voice as I do my best not to shout. Jesus, the storm! We're all going to drown! His eyes open slowly and instead of anger or frustration, I see compassion and concern there. He looks at me with that knowing look, seeing me not just outside but inside as well. That one look, he seems to unpack all the emotion that's welled up inside me. All the fear that's told me I'm going to drown. Somehow, despite everything within me, I can see peace in his eyes. He stands up and says, did you really think that I would let you drown? Is your faith really that small? Feeling somewhat guilty and ashamed, I hang my head and I do my best to avoid eye contact with him. But his eyes pierce right through me. Not with a look of correction, though. There isn't anything in those eyes that says shame on you or how dare you wake me up. There's just love and compassion. I'm here, he says. I know, I reply. I haven't left you. I know, I reply. You're not going to drown, he says. (laughs) Silence, I think. He can sense the doubt in me, but he doesn't say a word. He's waiting till I'm ready to say what's inside me. To share it with him in that intimate and vulnerable space. Do you doubt it? He asked me. Feeling caught and somewhat guilty and ashamed, I reply, yes, I do. Why? Haven't I shown you before that I care for you? He asks. Haven't you seen me by your side before? I continue to stare sheepishly at my feet, still feeling guilty, ashamed and somewhat embarrassed. Jesus takes my face in his hands and forces me to look him in his eyes. I love you. I'm here, he says. He slowly walks up the stairs and onto the deck of the boat. I can hear him speaking with authority but not yelling. The words barely rising above the sound of the wind and waves, whatever those words were, have barely escaped his mouth when the winds die down and the waves cease. I stare between him and the waves in amazement. I realize my mouth is hanging open with shock, wonder, and surprise. I quickly close it and slowly make my way towards him, doing my best to still avoid eye contact. Once again, he takes my head in his hand gently, compassionately, with love. He looks at me and says, I love you. I'm here. My head tries to drop again, but he won't let it. His hand beneath my chin keeps my eyes fixed on him. I love you. I'm here. And I still will be, even if you doubt me again. Let's pray. Jesus, when we say we will follow you wherever you go, we don't always understand what that's going to look like. I know the disciples didn't. Yet, Father, we we follow You and we say we hope, we pray that You don't abandon us. We hope, we pray that Your promises stay true. We hope and pray that, that we'll still be standing at the end of the storm. Father, meet us in that storm, I pray. Whatever it might be, whatever our storm could be. And God, if we're not in one, then Father, may we snuggle up to somebody who is. May we come alongside others and say, hey, Jesus is with you and so am I. I'm here for you. I'm here in this with you. God, we didn't deserve uh, anything, but you've given it to us. We didn't deserve salvation, but You've given it to us. 
Father, the Gospel isn't about deserving. The Gospel is about grace. And it meets us in that storm and says, You are not alone. I am with you. And I love you. So Father, for us in that, I pray that You would speak to us. You would meet us. You would remind us. You would give us hope. You would give us faith. You would give us persistence. For those of us not in that, Father, may we continue to keep our eyes fixed on You. And even as we started our time together, reading and and reciting out loud from Hebrews, remind us that we fix our eyes on You, the author, the perfecter of our faith, that in the storms and out of the storms, You are there. That You love us unconditionally. And that, Father, You are walking with us in all that. So Father, I pray that You would meet us. Remind us of Your goodness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When the storms of life threaten to overtake us, we may think that Jesus has abandoned us. We may look and realize that Jesus is sleeping, just like His disciples did. Instead, we find that he looks at us with compassion, tells us he loves us, tells us he's there, and then tells us that we're not going to drown. Jesus loves you. Jesus is with you. Call out to him, and he'll make his presence known to you. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.